This brings us to a suitable place at which to introduce one of the greatest lessons on personality ever placed on paper. It is also one of the most effective lessons on salesmanship ever written, for the subjects of attractive personality and salesmanship must always go hand in hand. They are inseparable. I have reference to Shakespeare's masterpiece, Mark Antony's speech at the funeral of Caesar. Perhaps you have read this oration, but it is here presented with interpretations and parentheses which may help you to gather a new meaning from it. The setting for that oration was something like the following. Caesar is dead, and Brutus, his slayer, is called on to tell the Roman mob that is gathered at the undertakers why he put Caesar out of the way. Picture, in your imagination, a howling mob that was none too friendly to Caesar and that already believed that Brutus had done a noble deed by murdering him. Brutus takes the platform and makes a short statement of his reasons for killing Caesar, confident that he has won the day he takes his seat. His whole demeanor is that of one who believes his word will be accepted without question. It is one of haughtiness. Mark Antony now takes the platform, knowing that the mob is antagonistic to him because he is a friend of Caesar. In a low, humble tone of voice, Antony begins to speak. Antony, for Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. Fourth citizen, what does he say of Brutus? Third citizen, he says, for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. Fourth citizen, but were best he speak no harm of Brutus here. First citizen, this Caesar was a tyrant. Third citizen, nay, that's certain, we are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Second citizen, peace. Let us hear what Antony can say. Here you will observe, in Antony's opening sentence, his clever method of neutralizing the minds of his listeners. Antony, you gentle Romans, dash, about as gentle as a gang of Bolsheviks in a revolutionary labor meeting. All, peace, ho, oh, let us hear him. Had Antony begun his speech by knocking Brutus, the history of Rome would have been different. Antony, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Allying himself with what he knew to be the state of mind of his listeners. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously bath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and surely he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. Hi, my name's Dart. I'm the person behind these videos. Please like and subscribe, and if you haven't already, be sure to sign up for the playlist so you can hear this book in its entirety. Now back to the book. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. At this point, Antony paused to give his audience a chance to discuss hurriedly, among themselves, his opening statements. His object in doing this was to observe what effect his words were having, just as a master salesman always encourages his prospective purchaser to talk so he may know what is in his mind. First citizen, methinks there is much in his sayings. Second citizen, if thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Thirty-five, third citizen, has he, masters? I fear there will be worse come in his place. Fourth citizen, marked he his words? He would not take the crown? Therefore, tis certain he was not ambitious. First citizen, if it be found so, someone will dear abide it. Second citizen, poor soul. His eyes are red as fire with weeping. Third citizen, there's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Fourth citizen, now mark him. He begins again to speak, Antony. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Masters, appealing to their vanity, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who, you all know, are honorable men. Observe how often Antony has repeated the term honorable. Observe, also, how cleverly he brings in the first suggestion that, perhaps, 
Brutus and Cassius may not be as honorable as the Roman mob believes them to be. This suggestion is carried in the words mutiny and rage, which he here uses for the first time, after his pause gave him time to observe that the mob was swinging over toward his side of the argument. Observe how carefully he is feeling his way and making his words fit that which he knows to be the frame of mind of his listeners. Antony, I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. Crystallizing his suggestion into hatred of Brutus and Cassius, he then appeals to their curiosity and begins to lay the foundation for his climax. A climax which he knows will win the mob because he is reaching it so cleverly that the mob believes it to be its own conclusion. Antony, but here's a parchment, with the seal of Caesar, I found it in his closet, tis his will, let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read dash. Tightening up on his appeal to their curiosity by making them believe he does not intend to read the will, and they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood, yeah, beg a hair of him for memory, and, dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. Human nature always wants that which is difficult to get, or that of which it is about to be deprived. Observe how craftily Antony has awakened the interest of the mob and made them want to hear the reading of the will, thereby preparing them to hear it with open minds. This marks his second step in the process of neutralizing their minds. All, the will, the will. We will hear Caesar's will. Antony, have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood. You are not stones, but men. And, being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. Exactly what he wishes to do. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs, for if you should, oh, what will come of it? Fourth citizen, read the will. We'll hear it. Anony, you shall read us the will. Caesar's will. Anony, will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. Daggers and stabbed suggest cruel murder. Observe how cleverly Antony injects this suggestion into his speech, and observe, also, how quickly the mob catches its significance, because, unknown to the mob, Antony has carefully prepared their minds to receive this suggestion. Fourth citizen, they were traitors, honorable men. All, the will, the testament. Second citizen, they were villains, murderers, the will. Just what Antony would have said in the beginning but he knew it would have a more desirable effect if he planted the thought in the in the minds of the mob and permitted them to say it themselves. Antony, you will compel me then to read the will? Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend, and will you give me leave? This was the point at which Brutus should have begun to look for a back door through which to make his escape. All, come down. Second citizen, descend. Third citizen, room for Antony, most noble and Tony. Antony. Nay, press not so upon me, stand far off. He knew this command would make them want to draw nearer, which is what he wanted them to do. All, stand back. Room. Antony, if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on, t'was on a summer's evening, in his tent, that day he overcame the nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through, see what a rent the envious casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors, to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no, for Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge. Oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For, when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and, in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statua, which all the while ran blood. Great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I, and you, and all of us fell down while bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the din of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind soul, why weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here, here is himself, marred, as you see, with traitors. Observe how Antony now uses the words traitors quite freely, because he knows that it is in harmony with that which is in the minds of the Roman mob. First citizen, O oh, piteous spectacle. Second citizen, O oh, woeful day. Third citizen, O oh, woeful day. First citizen, O oh, most bloody sight. Second citizen, we will be revenged. 
Had Brutus been a wise man instead of a braggart, he would have been many miles from the scene by this tune. All. Revenge. About. Seek. Burn. Fire. Kill. Slay. Let not a traitor live. Here Antony takes the next step toward crystallizing the frenzy of the mob into action, but, clever salesman that he is, does not try to force this action. Antony. Stay, countryman. First citizen. Peace there. Hear the noble Antony. Second citizen. We'll hear him. We'll follow him. We'll die with him. From these words Antony knows that he has the mob with him. Observe how he takes advantage of this psychological moment, the moment for which all master salesmen wait. Antony. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They were wise and honorable, and will, no doubt, with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator as Brutus is, but, as you know me all, a plain, blunt man, that love my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech, to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, therein Antony would ruffle up your spirits, and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. All, will mutiny. First citizen, will burn the house of Brutus. Third citizen, away, then. Come, seek the conspirators. Antony, yet hear me, countrymen. Yet hear me speak. All, peace, ho. Here, Antony. Most noble Antony. Antony, why, friends, you go to do you know not what, wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your love. Alas, you know not. I must tell you, then, you have forgot the will I told you of. Antony is now ready to play his trump card. He is ready to reach his climax. Observe how well he has marshaled his suggestions, step by step, saving until the last his most important statement, the one on which he relied for action. In the great field of salesmanship and in public speaking, many a man tries to reach this point too soon, tries to rush his audience or his prospective purchaser, and thereby loses his appeal. All, most true, the will. Let's stay and hear the will. Antony, here is the will, and under Caesar's seal. To every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, seventy-five drachmas. Second citizen, most noble Caesar, will revenge his death. Third citizen, O royal Caesar. Antony, hear me with patience. All, peace, ho. Antony, moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors and new planted orchards, on this side Tiber, he hath left them you, and to your heirs forever, common pleasures, to walk abroad and recreate yourself. Here was a Caesar. When come such another? First citizen, never, never. Come, away, away. We'll burn his body in the holy place, and with the brands fire the traitors' houses. Take up the body. Second citizen, go fetch fire. Third citizen, pluck down benches. Fourth citizen, pluck down forms, windows, anything. And that was Brutus finish. He lost his case because he lacked the personality and the good judgment with which to present his argument from the viewpoint of the Roman mob, as Mark Antony did. His whole attitude clearly indicated that he thought pretty well of himself, that he was proud of his deed. We have all seen people, in this day and time, who somewhat resemble Brutus in this respect. But, if we observe closely, we notice that they do not accomplish very much. Suppose that Mark Antony had mounted the platform in a strutting attitude, and had begun his speech in this wise. Now let me tell you Romans something about this man Brutus. He is a murderer at heart, and he would have gone no further. For the mob would have held him down. Clever salesman and practical psychologist that he was, Mark Antony so presented his case that it appeared not to be his own idea at all, but that of the Roman mob, itself. Go back to the lesson on initiative and leadership and read it again. And as you read, compare the psychology of it with that of Mark Antony's speech. Observe how the you, and not, I, attitude toward others was emphasized. Observe, if you please, how this same point is emphasized throughout this course, and especially in Lesson 7, on enthusiasm. Shakespeare was, by far, the most able psychologist and writer known to civilization. For that reason, all of his writings are based upon unerring knowledge of the human mind. Throughout this speech, which he placed in the mouth of Mark Antony, you will observe how carefully he assumed the you attitude, 
so carefully that the Roman mob was sure that its decision was of its own making. I must call your attention, however, to the fact that Mark Antony's appeal to the self-interest of the Roman mob was of the crafty type, and was based upon the stealth with which dishonest men often make use of this principle in appealing to the cupidity and avarice of their victims. While Mark Antony displayed evidence of great self-control in being able to assume, at the beginning of his speech, an attitude toward Brutus that was not real. At the same time, it is obvious that his entire appeal was based upon his knowledge of how to influence the minds of the Roman mob through flattery. The two letters reproduced in Lesson 7 of this course illustrate, in a very concrete way, the value of the U and the fatality of the I appeal. Go back and read these letters again and observe how the more successful of the two follows closely the Mark Antony appeal, while the other one is based upon an appeal of just the opposite nature. Whether you are writing a sales letter, or preaching a sermon, or writing an advertisement, or a book, you will do well to follow the same principles employed by Mark Antony in his famous speech. Now let us turn our attention to the study of ways and means through which one may develop a pleasing personality. Let us start with the first essential, which is character, for no one may have a pleasing personality without the foundation of a sound, positive character. Through the principle of telepathy you telegraph the nature of your character to those with whom you come in contact, which is responsible for what you have often called an intuitive feeling that the person whom you had just met, but about whom you did not know very much, was not trustworthy. You may embellish yourself with clothes of the neatest and latest design and conduct yourself in a most pleasing manner as far as outside appearances go. But if there is greed and envy and hatred and jealousy and avarice, and selfishness in your heart. You will never attract any, except those characters which harmonize with your own, like attracts like. And you may be sure, therefore, that those who are attracted to you are those whose inward natures parallel your own. You may embellish yourself with an artificial smile that belies your feelings, and you may practice the art of handshaking so that you can imitate, perfectly, the band shake of the person who is an adept at this art. But, if these outward manifestations of an attractive personality lack that vital factor called earnestness of purpose, they will repel instead of attract. How, then, may one build character? The first step in character building is rigid self-discipline. In both the second and eighth lessons of this course, you will find the formula through which you may shape your character after any pattern that you choose, but I repeat it here, as it is based upon a principle that will bear much repetition as follows. First, Select those whose characters were made up of the qualities which you wish to build into your own character, and then proceed, in the manner described in Lesson 2. 2. Appropriate these qualities, through the aid of auto-suggestion. Create, in your imagination, a council table and gather your characters around it each night, first having written out a clear, concise statement of the particular qualities that you wish to appropriate from each. Then proceed to affirm or suggest to yourself, in outspoken, audible words, that you are developing the desired qualities in yourself. As you do this, close your eyes and see, in your imagination, the figures seated around your imaginary table, in the manner described in Lesson 2. Second, through the principles described in Lesson 8, on self-control, control your thoughts and keep your mind vitalized with thoughts of a positive nature. Let the dominating thought of your mind be a picture of the person that you intend to be, the person that you are deliberately building, through this procedure, at least a dozen times a day. When you have a few minutes to yourself, shut your eyes and direct your thoughts to the figures which you have selected to sit at your imaginary council table, and feel, with a faith that knows no limitation, that you are actually growing to resemble in character those figures of your choice. Third, find at least one person each day, and more if possible, in whom you see some good quality that is worthy of praise, and praise it. Remember, however, that this praise must not be in the nature of cheap, insincere flattery. It must be genuine. Speak your words of praise with such earnestness that they will impress those to whom you speak. Then watch what happens. You will have rendered those whom you praise a decided benefit of great value to them. And you will have gone just one more step in the direction of developing the habit of looking for and finding the good qualities in others. I cannot overemphasize the far-reaching effects of this habit of praising, openly and enthusiastically, the good qualities in others for this habit will soon reward you with a feeling of self-respect and manifestation of gratitude from others. That will modify your entire personality. Here, again, the law of attraction enters, and those whom you praise will see, in you, the qualities that you see in them. Your success in the application of this formula will be in exact proportion to your faith in its soundness. I do not merely believe that it is sound. 
I know that it is. And the reason I know is that I have used it successfully and I have also taught others how to use it successfully. Therefore, I have a right to promise you that you can use it with equal success. Furthermore, you can, with the aid of this formula, develop an attractive personality so speedily that you will surprise all who know you. The development of such a personality is entirely within your own control, a fact which gives you a tremendous advantage and at the same time places upon you the responsibility if you fail or neglect to exercise your privilege. I now wish to direct your attention to the reason for speaking, aloud, the affirmation that you are developing the desired qualities which you have selected as the materials out of which to develop an attractive personality. This procedure has two desirable effects, namely first, it sets into motion the vibration through which the thought back of your words reaches and embeds itself in your subconscious mind, where it takes root and grows until it becomes a great moving force in your outward. Physical activities, leading in the direction of transformation of the thought into reality. Second, it develops in you the ability to speak with force and conviction which will lead, finally, to great ability as a public speaker. No matter what your calling in life may be, you should be able to stand upon your feet and speak convincingly, as this is one of the most effective ways of developing an attractive personality. Put feeling and emotion into your words as you speak, and develop a deep, rich tone of voice. If your voice is inclined to be high-pitched, tone it down until it is soft and pleasing. You can never express an attractive personality to best advantage through a harsh or shrill voice. You must cultivate your voice until it becomes rhythmical and pleasing to the ear. Remember that speech is the chief method of expressing your personality, and for this reason it is to your advantage to cultivate a style that is both forceful and pleasing. I do not recall a single outstanding attractive personality that was not made up, in part, of ability to speak with force and conviction. Study the prominent men and women of today, wherever you find them, and observe the significant fact that the more prominent they are the more efficient are they in speaking forcefully. Study the outstanding figures of the past in politics and statesmanship and observe that the most successful ones were those who were noted for their ability to speak with force and conviction. In the field of business, industry, and finance, it seems significant, also, that the most prominent leaders are men and women who are able public speakers. In fact, no one may hope to become a prominent leader in any noteworthy undertaking without developing the ability to speak with forcefulness that carries conviction. While the salesman may never deliver a public address, he will profit, nevertheless, if he develops the ability to do so, because this ability increases his power to talk convincingly in ordinary conversation. Let us now summarize the chief factors which enter into the development of an attractive personality as follows. First, form the habit of interesting yourself in other people and make it your business to find their good qualities and speak of them in terms of praise. Second, develop the ability to speak with force and conviction, both in your ordinary conversational tones and before public gatherings, where you must use more volume. Third, clothe yourself in a style that is becoming to your physical build and the work in which you are engaged. Fourth, develop a positive character through the aid of the formula outlined in this lesson. Fifth, learn how to shake hands so that you express warmth of feeling and enthusiasm through this form of greeting. Sixth, attract other people to you by first attracting yourself to them. Seventh, remember that your only limitation, within reason, is the one which you set up in your own mind. These seven points cover the most important factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality but it seems hardly necessary to suggest that such a personality will not develop of its own accord. It will develop, if you submit yourself to the discipline herein described, with a firm determination to transform yourself into the person that you would like to be. As I study this list of seven important factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality, I feel moved to direct your attention to the second and the fourth as being the most important. If you will cultivate those finer thoughts and feelings and actions, out of which a positive character is built, and then learn to express yourself with force and conviction, you will have developed an attractive personality. For it will be seen that out of this attainment will come the other qualities here outlined. There is a great power of attraction back of the person who has a positive character, and this power expresses itself through unseen as well as visible sources. The moment you come within speaking distance of such a person, even though not a word is spoken, the influence of the unseen power within makes itself felt. Every shady transaction in which you engage, every negative thought that you think, and every destructive act in which you indulge, destroys just so much of that subtle something within you that is known as character. There is full confession in the glances of our eyes, 
in our smiles, in salutations, in the grasp of the hands. His sin bedobs him, mars all his good impression. Men know not why they do not trust him, but they do not trust him. His vice glasses his eye, demeans his cheek, pinches the nose, sets the mark of beast on the back of the head, and writes, O oh fool, fool, on the forehead of a king. Emerson, I would direct your attention, now, to the first of the seven factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality. You have observed that all through this lesson I have gone into lengthy detail to show the material advantages of being agreeable to other people. However, the biggest advantage of all lies, not in the possibility of monetary or material gain which this habit offers, but in the beautifying effect that it has upon the character of all who practice it. Acquire the habit of making yourself agreeable and you profit both materially and mentally, for you will never be as happy in any other way as you will be when you know that you are making others happy. Remove the chips from your shoulders and quit challenging men to engage you in useless arguments. Remove the smoked glasses through which you see what you believe to be the blueness of life, and behold the shining sunlight of friendliness in its stead. Throw away your hammer and quit knocking, for surely you must know that the big prizes of life go to the builders and not the destroyers. The man who builds a house is an artist, the man who tears it down is a junkman. If you are a person with a grievance the world will listen to your vitriolic ravings, providing it does not see you coming, but... If you are a person with a message of friendliness and optimism, it will listen because it wishes to do so. No person with a grievance can be also a person with an attractive personality. The art of being agreeable, just that one simple trait, is the very foundation of all successful salesmanship. I drive my automobile five miles into the outskirts of the city to purchase gasoline which I could procure within two blocks of my own garage because the man who runs the filling station is an artist. He makes it his business to be agreeable. I go there not because he has cheaper gasoline, but because I enjoy the vitalizing effect of his attractive personality. 50th Street and Broadway, in New York, not 55, because I cannot find other good shoes at the same price, but for the reason that Mr. Cobb, the manager of that particular Regal store, has an attractive personality. While he is fitting me with shoes, he makes it his business to talk to me on subjects which he knows to be close to my heart. I do my banking at the Harriman National Bank, at 44th Street and 5th Avenue not because there are not scores of other good banks much nearer my place of business, but for the reason that the tellers, and the cashiers, and the lobby detective, and Mr. Harriman, and all of the others, with whom I come in contact, make it their business to be agreeable. My account is small, but they receive me as though it were large. I greatly admire John D. Rockefeller, Jr., not because he is the son of one of the world's richest men, but for the better reason that he, too, has acquired the art of being agreeable. In the little city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, lives M. T. Garvin, a very successful merchant whom I would travel hundreds of miles to visit, not because he is a wealthy merchant, but for the reason that he makes it his business to be agreeable. However, I have no doubt that his material success is closely related to this noble art of affability which he has acquired. I have in my vest pocket a Parker fountain pen, and my wife and children have pens of the same brand, not because there are not other good fountain pens but for the reason that Slash have been attracted to George S. Parker on account of his habit of being agreeable. My wife takes the ladies' home journal, not because there are not other good magazines of a similar nature, but for the reason that we became attracted to the journal several years ago, while Edward Bach was its editor, because he had acquired the art of being agreeable. Ye struggling pilgrims, who were searching for the rainbow's end, ye drawers of water and hewers of wood, Tarry for a moment by the wayside and learn a lesson from the successful men and women who have succeeded because they acquired the art of being agreeable. You can win, for a time, through ruthlessness and stealth. You can garner in more of this world's goods than you will need, by sheer force and shrewd strategy, without taking the time or going to the trouble of being agreeable. But, sooner or later, you will come to that point in life at which you will feel the pangs of remorse and the emptiness of your well-filled purse. I never think of power and position and wealth that was attained by force, without feeling, very deeply, the sentiment expressed by a man whose name I dare not mention, as he stood at the tomb of Napoleon. A little while ago, I stood by the grave of the old Napoleon, a magnificent tomb of gilt and gold, fit almost for a deity dead, and gazed upon the sarcophagus of rare and nameless marble, where rest at last the ashes of that restless man. I leaned over the balustrade and thought about the career of the greatest soldier of the modem world. I saw him at Talon. I saw him walking upon the banks of the Seine contemplating suicide. I saw him putting down the mob in the streets of Paris. 
I saw him at the head of the army in Italy. I saw him crossing the bridge at Lodi with the tricolor in his hand. I saw him in Egypt, in the shadows of the pyramids. I saw him conquer the Alps and mingle the eagles of France with the eagles of the crags. I saw him at Marengo, at Ulm, and at Austerlitz. I saw him in Russia, when the infantry of the snow and the cavalry of the wild blast scattered his legions like winter's withered leaves. I saw him at Leipzig in defeat and disaster, driven by a million bayonets back upon Paris, clutched like a wild beast, banished to Elba. I saw him escape and retake an empire by the force of his genius. I saw him upon the frightful field of Waterloo, where chance and fate combined to wreck the fortunes of their former king. And I saw him at St. Helena, with his hands crossed behind him, gazing out upon the sad and solemn sea. I thought of the widows and orphans he had made, of the tears that had been shed for his glory, and of the only woman who ever loved him, pushed from his heart by the cold hand of ambition. And I said I would rather have been a French peasant and worn wooden shoes. I would rather have lived in a hut with a vine growing over the door, and the grapes growing purple in the amorous kisses of the autumn sun. I would rather have been that poor peasant. With my wife by my side knitting as the day died out of the sky, with my children upon my knees and their arms about me, I would rather have been this man and gone down to the tongueless silence of the dreamless dust than to have been. That imperial personation of force and murder, known as Napoleon the Great. I leave with you, as a fitting climax for this lesson, the thought of this deathless dissertation on a man who lived by the sword of force and died an ignominious death, an outcast in the eyes of his fellow men, a sword to the memory of civilization, a failure because he did not acquire the art of being agreeable, because he could not or would not subordinate self for the good of his followers.